Can everybody hear me? Sandesh, can I start? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma well, uh, I, uh, if, if you people had been there for the last lecture, you wouldn't know as to what happened there. But people who have joined maybe on, only on this lecture, I'll give you a little brief about the last lecture. Uh, but, and also about a little brief of Professor Indu Agnihotri. And uh, see, the last lecture was more, more or less pre-independence and uh, in the 20th century. And uh, we covered uh, the spe specific documents and the specific document, uh, which was mostly in detail covered was the women's role in planned economy document, which is a subcommittee report of a planned economy uh, committee. And uh, most of the issues which were covered were uh, the discrimination, child marriage, matrimonial property, property rights, marriage related, related laws, CCC, that is the common civil court, birth control and economic contribution of women in family. And also they were very interestingly, they, there was also an issue raised in the subcommittee on some regulation on time women spend in kitchen. So these are the very, very varied, uh, in fact, issues which this, these committees or the women in that time had raised. So which also came up in this discussion that uh, people were talking about is of how is it really something on liberal feminism? But uh, of course, the speaker did say that the uh, it's not liberal feminism alone here, which is which can see the the eye through which we can look at these perspectives. Basically, are much more. So if you the con contemporary gender analysis actually uh, uh, is much more beyond the beyond the gender analysis which we are doing to today, because of many many perspectives were, were there in those issues which were raised there. And uh, she had uh, uh, she also discussed was something on feminism uh, in the in the uh, in the in the in the discussion. So she, in fact, uh, just briefly about Professor Indu Agnihotri, she has she has recently retired as director CWDS, which she had joined after giving up her job in uh, Delhi University College, where she was teaching history for more than two decades, and she was uh, and she is a unique personality which has a combination of academic academic and also activism joined together. She had been a very, very active person in the, in the grassroots and she still is in the sense that it's very difficult for us to get time from her. She's always keeps up, she's very busy even after her retirement. So you can imagine the kind of uh, resources she has which she, she really can share in these lectures. So uh, today's uh, sub theme is uh, breaking the silence, women's perspective on rights and change in contemporary times. So please welcome Professor Indu Agnihotri. So over to Professor Indu Agnihotri, please. Okay, thank you, Manji. Thank you for assigning me a very, very challenging task of covering such a wide range of issues, time span, and trying to encapsulate it in some kind of a structure, which is very uh, sort of the, these developments defy structures and defy any kind of schema. However, for the uh, purpose of these lectures, I have tried to uh, define my universe in a very, very restricted manner in terms of my sources and the resources I draw upon, even as the time span and the discussion uh, cuts across um, almost a hundred years now, more than a hundred years, and also um, the spheres uh, in which these sort of uh, uh, the participants whose lives I focus on, whose work I focus on, what they foray into, uh, I mean, it just cannot be put in any kind of a box. So I'm extremely aware of what the limitations of this exercise are. And that is why also because, you know, the in, women's movement in India is so vast, so diverse, that actually four lectures is just not enough, especially if you want to capture the ground level um, sentiments, the feelers, the issues that emerge, the nature of participation, uh, as well as the levels at which women have participated as active agents for change, change both in their lives as well as the life of the people and the nation. So I'm extremely aware and that is why one of the reasons why I have stuck to a format where I say that I'm going to look at a set of documents because the set of documents is meant to open up the wider world view. It cannot cover everything. So I, uh, I will be guilty of the charge that I have not covered so many things, but 
I'm starting with that disclaimer and that caveat that it is not possible. The Indian women's movement, the energy it has unleashed, the kind of vibrancy it shows at any point of time, any point of time I'm saying, I, as an activist for more than 40 years now, I can say that anything that I say here is only the tip of the iceberg. So I begin with that. Secondly, the this specific lecture, what it begins to focus on. I choose what I can call two sets of documents. It is not any one document. In fact, the first set of documents that I choose, there is a very critical document, which is the outcome of the first set of documents, which I choose to focus on in this lecture, which is that I for begin with the debates and the proceedings of the Constituent Assembly. Now, this itself is a vast document, huge set of documents. The outcome of this document, as we all know, is firstly a very, very critical document and which remains critical in our political life, in our social life, in our cultural life, and that is the Constitution of India. Why I focus on the proceedings is because I think uh, just as much as the constitution itself is important, it is the process and the manner of going about, uh, you know, the manner in which these very, very uh, signi uh, this significant exercise of how to give yourself a constitution, how to give the people of India a constitution, that process itself is, I think, extremely important. Equally important is the fact that women were part of this process, that the constitution was not just given to women, that there were a critical, very small number, but a critical set of women who were part of that process. And I think that itself makes a statement that the those who went about uh, giving us this constitution were aware and were committed to women's participation in this process of change, that they were not going to be marginal, they were not going to be added on, they were not going to be brought on later once the rights had been defined, but that women were equally participants of that exercise and that process of uh, laying down the parameters within which the new nation state and the new sovereign republic was being envisaged. And I think that itself is a, that is why I say I focus on the constituent assembly debates and proceedings. So the second point that I want to make about the debates is why do I call it debates? And why do all of us call it CA debates or proceedings? You know, Even when we write abbreviation for the Constituent Assembly, we say CAD. Usually the book reference will be CAD. Why is it important? What I'm saying is, you know, there is this sense that is sometimes conveyed to us that, oh, these are critical times. There's no room for debate. This is not the time to argue. This is not the time to dissent. But what I'm saying is here you have the Constituent Assembly, which begins to meet towards the end of 1946, it sort of gives us the Constitution, which is signed on the 24th of January 1950 by all the members of the Constituent Assembly. It is the most critical time in the history of this country, in, in the history of the nation. Because yes, the British have decided to give us freedom, the much fought for freedom, but it is the time when a set of rules and procedures are to be put in motion and a body is elected and an elected body begins to meet to draft this constitution. It is the time when you see freedom, what the British choose to call transfer of power, but in Indian history, we always call, call it the struggle for independence and the struggle for freedom. It is also a new set of uh, governance structures it is also the period in which we see partition and then the formation and the proclamation of the Republic. What I'm saying is in the last hundred years, there could not have been more critical times than this. There, there can never be more critical times perhaps till some more tumultuous events happen in this history. And yet it is in that period that they, we set up and we see a healthy process of debate, discussion, dissent. 
disagreements and a set of people who sometimes fundamentally disagree with each other also but who agree on one point that this country needs a constitution that some consensus has to be arrived at that that process itself has to be democratic and the outcome of that process also should be committed to democracy so as nehru says when he starts uh, you know um uh, he places the first resolution in a sense the not the first technical resolution but the first resolution which has a uh, political meaning and the resolution on aims and objects uh for which lays down the work of the constituent assembly he says this is not just a document this is not just a resolution it is a pledge it is a pledge that we are making to ourselves and to the people of this country that we will abide by democracy and i think that is a very important uh, apart from the preamble which we have heard of much more over the last one year or so but the preamble itself also um, sort of foregrounds those commitments now uh, having said this about the constituent assembly i then want to also lay out the structure of this lecture today so this um, th what i intend to do how much i can do i'm not sure but three parts one is what i've already spelled out in terms of the constituent assembly the second part Uh, or the third part which i will also focus on uh, right now is the committee and the findings of a committee which is a government committee which is which is well known which is the committee on the status of women in india and its report called towards equality and this we see the committee set up in the early 1970s the report is submitted in at the end of 1974 it is placed in parliament in 1975 and it is uh, available in pr in print to us over the year but it actually is taken note of only 1977 and if we know the history of our country we will understand what 1975 meant it meant many things at the international level as well as at the national level 1975 was declared the international year of women women's year and then 1975 to 85 was declared the international women's decade but while all this was going on at the international level and there was a lot of hoo ha and uh, activities going on in india also around uh, this whole preparation for the mex first un women conference in mexico in 1975 but i think uh, i mean tragedy had already struck the nation in a sense and that, that was a, one of our deepest political tragedies which was the declaration of the emergency and i will sum up this part uh, uh, the significance of this moment again that uh, when we had a discussion uh, which was organized by the center for women's development studies some 20 years after the report had come out and those members who were still there were there as well as other invited um, speakers and all some of the women leaders like pramila dandavate and others who were participating in this discussion in 1995 uh, said to us and said to the committee members that actually we read your report sitting in jail because they were in prison they were behind bars during the emergency so there were a lot of women members like ahilya rangneka premila uh, dandavate mrinal gore and many others who were sitting in prison right through the emergency and that is where they read this report and they came out saying when we come out then we will take up all the issues that this report has placed now what i'm saying is that it is interesting that even in the cswi there are certain notes of dissent if you interacted with committee members they used to say there were disagreements on any number of issues but they too felt that despite noting dissent on one or two aspects and i will discuss that when i discuss the document itself there was always space for dissent so what i'm saying is dissent debate arguments 
difference of opinion only strengthen our democracy. And in all our platforms, we should be able to find space for healthy traditions which strengthen our democracy. So with this, the in-between period is equally important. The in-between period, meaning from 1950 when the constitution comes in place and 1975 when the towards equality report comes into our hands is a roughly a period of 25 years and the first years first 25 years of independent india in a sense now in the writing of the women's movement these years have been referred to very often as the silent years and this was a debate that some of us were a part of since 19, end of 1980s, I can say, early 90s. You know, suddenly this phrase started floating around, oh, what happened after independence? How come these represent the silent years? And you will find that the title I have given to this lecture is exactly the opposite. Now, I'm posing it as a problematic. What I'm posing as a problematic is that the silent years, what we call the silent years, what is silence? How do women speak in times of silence? Is this silence or is it a time when people, uh, women particularly, are looking for a voice and looking for platforms where they can raise their voice? And if there is silence, then what are the reasons behind that silence? Also, is it silence per se? Or is it that we have a notion that the women's movement represents these, these things? And if these, these things are not happening, or if these issues are not coming up, then it means there's a silence. Now I'm posing it as a question mark to ourselves with the hope that we will do more research, just as women's studies in India has taken up many of these challenges. And today we have so much material that we have had to revise our sort of earlier foregone conclusions to some extent on these issues. So with this, I will begin the actual presentation. It's already 20 minutes past, as I can see. So Nuresh, it will be uh, just to you know give us an idea. I've put together some photographs and one or two other slides. So Nuresh, you can put uh, together the uh, Constituent Assembly slides, uh, the f pictures, the photographs. Yeah. Now, these are the 15 women who are uh, members of the, all of them are not there, uh, a few are missing, but these are women who pa are part of the constituent assembly debates. And uh, I must acknowledge this is the CWDS's calendar for 2018. If you don't know about the calendar, you should go to the website and see. It's a calendar which uh, our colleague Malvika Karlikar brings out every year. And it is a, a sort of history and a, a level of documentation in itself. I will briefly talk about some of these women as I come to the thing. So the uh, assembly starts to meet um, in December 1946. There are 389 members representing different states, provinces, regions, princely states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As I said, Nehru places the uh, aims and objects resolution, wherein he is very clear about what it is, that it shall guarantee and secure to all the people of India justice, social, economic, and political, equality of status, of opportunity, and before the law, freedom of thought, expression, belief, faith, vocation, association and then there's a little bit on public morality it talks about adequate safeguards provided for minorities for the backward communities tribal areas and depressed and other backward classes and uh, of course the uh, uh, goals of justice uh, in the republic etc i'm not going to read out the whole resolution but he uh, sort of refers to the resolve of the people he also refers to the dream that people have. And he says that uh, he refers to this moment as having some magic in terms of the transition from the old to the new. 
Uh, and he says that there may be clouds. I mean, he's referring to the whole specter of partition, which is haunting the people of India in 1946, which then becomes a reality. But he uh, says, uh, he pledges, and he says that this is something we owe to all those who have struggled and given up their lives for freedom, who have labored for this day that we see today. And of course, uh, it is interesting. I mean, you know, we nowadays think of the law and of the constitution as a very, very harsh reality. But Nehru being what he is, he says that whatever force might be behind all this, people who are able and clever and very intelligent, somehow like the imaginative daring which should accompany great officers. For if you have to deal with any people, you have to understand them imaginatively. You should understand them emotionally. And of course, you have to also understand them intellectually. And I think some of these words give you not only the flavor of the uh, debates, but they also give you the sensitivity which these people collectively brought to the debates that they were a part of. Similarly, if we look at uh, Ambedkar, I mean, now Ambedkar has, is, uh, has the seminal role in this whole process. He's uh, heading the drafting committee of the constitution. But he's also constantly being, uh, you know, uh, he also faces differences of opinion and arguments, apart from the longer history of differences between Ambedkar and the Congress and the role um, that different uh, leaders played in the preceding years. But uh, Ambedkar comes under some kind of a discussion in this assembly debates where he is being told that, look, you're getting too technical in the constitution and you're going too much into administration. Uh, why are you paying so much um, uh, attention to administration? So I'll just read out a few lines which he says. He says, um, while everybody recognizes the necessity of the uh, uh, necessity um, of the diffusion of constitutional morality for the peaceful working of a democratic constitution. There are two things interconnected with it, which are not unfortunately generally recognized. One is that the form of administration has a close connection with the form of the constitution. The form of the administration must be appropriate to, and in the same sense as the form of the constitution. The other is that it is perfectly possible to pervert the constitution without changing its form by merely changing the form of the administration and to make it inconsistent and opposed to the spirit of constitution. It follows that it is only where people are saturated with constitutional morality, such as the dis one described, and he has referred to a historian before this earlier, that one can take the risk of omitting from the constitution details of administration and leaving it for the legislature. In other words, he's saying that in the three arms between the legislature, executive, and the Gov uh, judiciary, you cannot leave the details and the tech as technicalities for of administration to be handled only by the legislature, but there is to be an inherent content of that in the constitution because that is to be defined by what he calls the spirit of the constitution or the constitutional morality. And I think that that is important. He says constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to le learn it. Democracies in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. Now, when he says, which is essentially undemocratic, what does it mean? He refers to the social contradictions, the tensions, a society which is fraught with contradictions, with feudalism, power vested in the princely state still then, 
and the feudal classes, the landowning classes and the landless. And we all know what the histories of those kind of landlessness and land ownership uh, mean. So what I'm saying is that the constitution makers were aware of it. It is within this that the uh, CAD uh, take place. And there also, what do we assume? You know, today when we read all this, we assume there is a nation. But you have to understand that uh, when they begin the process in December 1946, the states have not all acceded as yet. There's, that negotiation is still on. The feudal powers uh, with these ruling classes are still there. Apart from the, um, after all, this is the uh, vestiges of colonial rule and colonial society. So all the inequalities inherent in society are still there. And I would say they are still there because what the constitution promises equality, but it does not forge equality between the social classes. That the constitution, the law, the executive, judiciary and legislature have to work towards that once the constitution is in place. So you have differences in terms of language, even during the debates that happens because people are speaking in different languages. Um, uh, even, I mean, for instance, there's a whole section where they go into how, what will happen to the commodities because sugar is produced in one region, how will it reach the others? So what will be the terms of transferring these resources and making these resources available to the entire population of this country? So the uh, uh, Constituent Assembly is in a sense discussing both power, it's discussing the rules, through which this power will be exercised, the financial architecture, the terms for the judiciary, the terms for all the three arms, going right down to the panchayat level. They are acutely aware of differences in terms of caste, class, labor, laboring classes, peasantry, the farmers. Uh, the re uh, debates reflect uh, uh, discussions on gender, on culture and heritage. Uh, the whole debate on education. There's a whole section on should there be separate kinds of education and the women, uh, women like Hansa Mehta, for instance, who's in this picture. Uh, Hansa Mehta uh, comes from a, a longer engagement with education and educational committees and the, they take a position that there can be no separate and there should be no separate education for women, which will put them in a certain kind of box. So what I'm saying is the Constituent Assembly, which is um, engaging itself uh, with the drafting of the Constitution, with a whole long debate on fundamental rights, the resolutions related to it, the amendments that are moved, and with administrative procedure. They even go into details like, OK, how, for instance, when discussing rights, uh, in terms of Adivasis, the Jhum cultivation, hill people, Northeast, the forest resources, agriculture, mines, minerals, um, uh, descent and inheritance, they discuss migration patterns, uh, the uh, sort of tensions between the plains people and the tribals in the Northeast, particularly the subregions within the Northeast. What I'm saying is that this assembly looks at the past, it looks at the future. It looks at populations, peoples, as well as institutional histories of these regions. They're engaging with the whole idea of specific reservations for uh, specific communities, groups, uh, whether it's the scheduled uh, castes as it comes out then as a constitutional category or the scheduled tribes which were initially referred to as um, excluded areas and excluded uh, communities in a sense. They even go into discussing plants, ecology, uh, uh, language, health and disease patterns, diversities within region, the political histories of exclusion, as well as the potentialities of different regions the uh, principle of representation from these different parts and the whole legislative architecture and structure going down from the village panchayat to the parliament. And I think the fact that they could find time 
they could make time for discussion, for debate, disagreement, and yet coming to a formulation which was then accepted upon and uh, which gave to the people of India this constitution. I think it was a tremendous exercise. And when we look at the constitution, we really don't see what all has gone into it, how difficult it was and how what maturity they show. Because as they say, here are the British waiting to see that the whole exercise flops. Here is the world looking at us to see what India will make of its freedom. And of course, there is the tension. There is an ever present tension for the first year of the Constituent Assembly proceedings because there is a section of its membership which is boycotting this Constituent Assembly, which is those who were part of the Muslim League and Muslim League uh, boycotted the proceedings because they said that uh, they were uh, for a separate country, for a separate nation. So, and the, you know, their seats are kept vacant and there's this constant appeal being uh, given out saying, uh, you know, we still uh, request these people to come back. And when it is clear that these people are not going to be part, because these were all e elected members of the uh, uh, bodies which, uh, from which the Constituent Assembly is put together. At that point also, one thing that runs through the debates, through the debates, there is a huge discussion on minorities and, um, and minorities meaning not just religious minorities, but religious minorities are a very clear part and distinct part of the debates. But there is a constant discussion and this, despite differences, the assurance and the need to provide an assurance saying that the, I mean, that the minorities hopefully in the future will not remain minorities, that that status of being a minority, be it in terms of the Dalits, et cetera. So with all these uh, sections of Indian society and people who are uh, in a sense uh, um, apart in terms of their uh, status, opportunities, identity, uh, discriminations, exclusions. The, there is a continuous and constant and it is there th through or almost on a daily basis that members are assuring themselves and assuring the nation that the constitution that we are giving to ourselves will take care of all these inequalities, these contradictions and these tensions. So that runs through it. I'll quickly move to um, uh, what I call the women in the Constituent Assembly. And uh, I can't cover all, so I'll just talk about one or two uh, aspects. There's Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, who's already uh, moved in a sense to the international level because she addresses the UN General Assembly. She's India's representative. And she makes a very powerful sort of uh, um, intervention in the United Nations, um, um, expressing and declaring India's opposition to imperialism and to the feudal classes and to the inequalities that have been perpetrated. And she uh, uh, expects that all these, that these are inconsistent with the UN Charter and that the UN in its own functioning will address these contradictions, which are exist in the larger political world. And she specifically mentions fascism and Nazism and declares India's opposition to anything which represents uh, fascistic trends. There's Renuka Ray, who's equally important. She is one of the voices who's constantly mentioned when we discuss the issue of reservation, because Renuka Ray articulated the women's position on reservation. You all would know that from the time the suffrage demand came up, this discussion was coming up. And at one point of time during the roundtable conferences, the British had brought in the whole issue of uh, separate electorates as well as reservation. Uh, and reservation both in terms of women as well as reservation in terms of minority status. And there were differences of opinion. But in the Constituent Assembly, clearly Renuka Ray makes a very clear statement on behalf of women and saying, we do not want reservation. We stand opposed to reservation for women I'm talking about, or even on uh, basis of religion. And further, the 
hope and the expectation that in independent India, there will be no need for reservation. That is also very clear in her intervention on clause 19, which is on reservation. There is Dakshayani Velayudhan, whose picture, yes, that is Dakshayani. She's one of the youngest members. I haven't been able to figure out if she is the youngest member, but she's definitely one of the youngest members and definitely the youngest woman member of the Constituent Assembly. She's also the only Dalit woman amongst the uh, women's uh, Constituent Assembly members. She incidentally happens to come from a family which was very politically active. And I think many of you may know her daughter who's kept that tradition alive. And her daughter is Mira Velayudhan, who's very much part of women's studies. And she's the, currently the president of the IAWS. Now, uh, Dakshayani um, uh, makes very uh, two, three very powerful interventions. Uh, one focuses on what we call the underdogs, on the whole issue of forced labor, uh, Begar, and she links it with the rights of freedom, which is under Clause 11, which is being discussed when the rights are being discussed in the parliament. And she makes a very powerful speech about how, I mean, in a sense, uh, positing bondage and bondage of the landless and the Dalits vis-a-vis uh, -vis the freedom that is being promised. She also um, uh, talks about untouchability. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that Shaini Velayudhan was a Gandhian, even though she agreed with Ambedkar on many things. So despite the differences between Gandhi and Ambedkar during these years, uh, the Kshayani is uh, aligned with the uh, Gandhian movement, but she continuously dialogues with Ambedkar and in a, uh, there are occasions in the uh, assembly debates where she's telling Ambedkar, look, you should be thinking about this, you know, so it's not a position of weakness or vulnerability. She has her own mind and she speaks it. And then she talks about how she says that the constituent assembly, that it not only frames a constitution, but also gives the people a new framework of life. And then she moves on to other issues. There's Amu Swaminathan, who speaks on fundamental rights, directive principles, the two pillars of the constitution. Renu Kari, I've already mentioned, although she spoke and intervened on many, many more issues. Um, there's Begum Ajaz Rasul, who is the only Muslim woman in this, uh, uh, in the women in the assembly and who opposes separate electorates on the basis of religion. She has very sharp views on secularity and intervenes continuously on the fundamental rights resolution to bring more strength to it. There's, of course, Durga Bai Deshmukh, who spoke about the whole issue of princely uh, states. Um, she talks about the need for neutrality of the governor. Uh, on the independence of the judiciary and how high courts should be constituted so that they are not uh, forced to be um, dependent and therefore maybe their freedom will be con compromised. Um, there's Hans, uh, the, I mean, there's much more. Hansa Mehta, of course, uh, you may know Hansa Mehta's um, um, contribution is not just in the Constituent Assembly. Hansa Mehta was the Indian representative when the UN Charter was being framed. And the word human in the UN Charter was Hansa Mehta's contribution because the uh, draft said men. And she said, no, we are talking about humans and not men alone. So that gender neutral category, that was Hansa Mehta. She's known for that uh, contribution at the international level. Of course, her uh, work on education when she's later vice chancellor also is very important. There's Purnima Banerjee, there's Sucheta Kriplani, Rajkumari Amritkor, Annie Mascarinas, Kamla Chaudhary, Leela Ray, Malti Chaudhary, and of course, the indomitable Sarojini Naidu. Now, there's no time, so I'm jumping from that. Uh, I'll just briefly say a few points about the silent years, and then I will move. What I'm saying about the silent years is you have to remember, this was a period both of dreams of utopia and of euphoria. It's also the period right after partition. So there is a lot of stress and uh, tension in society. 
you also have to remember that this is immediately post bengal famine in a sense there's shortages of war of cloth if you read the documents of the 40s there's continuous efforts to address these shortages food shortage uh, thanks to the war and post war regime and now an independent india there's the whole um, consciousness of breaking away from the shackles of colonial rule and yet an uncertainty about what future holds out um there's uh, an attempt to grapple with feudalism because you must remember the telangana struggle is still on when freedom comes so telangana movement spreads before and after freedom struggle in a sense and there's a lot of power of abuse atrocity violence including on women more than anything else i think we need to remember that this years the early years of independence you know uh, after all you've just got freedom and anyone who criticizes and says why are you doing this or why is this not happening they've been told you know oh you're you're critical of freedom and i think the left particularly was in that position because you will remember uh, the left with its agenda for socio economic justice and equality was sort of positing ki ye azadi adhuri hai they were also saying is this freedom going to be for real in terms of opportunities and rights of all the people so there were all these questions and there were questions about those who were raising these questions they were a beleaguered uh, you also have to remember that in the first uh, decade of independence it is the left which is the main opposition and what is the condition of the left many of them are in jail because of the telangana struggle etc and they continue to be in jail many are underground including women and many are injured they are uh, facing overcoming the uh, uh, uncertainties of the telangana struggle having failed but there's also an attempt then to put uh, actions in place to put struggles in place um some are then again put behind bars in the 1960s when the indo china war happens so this is the state of the opposition the right opposition that we see uh, i mean there's not much there was shyam prasad mukherjee and of course there were many who were um closet uh, sort of communalist you may say but who have been uh, taken along in the constituent assembly debates but this is the background in which then and these women some are elected to parliament then for instance many of these uh, from the assembly as well as new people like renu chakravarti who then try to use the parliamentary forum to push for debates for instance they bring a law on dowry which is not accepted the private members bill uma nehru brings renu chakravarti brings finally we have an anti dowry law in 1961 um uh, there's a, a discussion around uh, women's work and rights and the maternity benefit bill is uh, brought in of course later during the emergency the equal remuneration act and all these are efforts put together by some of the women members who are supported by uh, their parties or some people across parties also uh the biggest challenge at this time still is the problem that india is left with after partition and which is the problem of what we call the refugees so north india and the re uh, refugees from west punjab who are spread all over india but particularly the north and delhi and of course the east bengal refugees now um, and a problem to convince and give confidence to the people that we will follow the secular path despite all this tension so this is where the women are working they're setting up programs for uh, not only relief but also uh, economic rehabilitation durga bai deshmukh is very much part of the central social welfare board um rameshwari nehru and sarabhai and all are part of all these now it's not as if there are no struggles if you read charmishta that to gupta's book on bengal uh, the journals you will find that there's a lot of that if you read gargi chakravarti's work on the national federation of indian women's work during this period you will find uh, that there were struggles going on 
um, uh, Mira's own work on the choir workers and the women's movement in Kerala gives us that. Um, then there are organizational documents. Even if you go to the Delhi archives, you will find Saheli Samaj and Saheli Sabha and all in Delhi, working in Jamia, in Old Delhi, etc. There's the History Sabha in Punjab. So it's not as if women's organizations, and of course, the All India Women's Conference is very much there. The National Federation of Indian Women comes up in 1954. It is set up, it's formed. And then they start work. You will also be surprised to know, most of us don't know about these things, that in the wake of the political struggle, the first conflicts which happened between the Nehruvian government and the um, Telangana people's uh, armed struggle, uh, after that, there are many, many political prisoners in India. And in April 1949, when massive agitations were on for the rights of these political prisoners, on April 29, in a police firing in Calcutta, four women died on the streets of Calcutta. Their names are there. There's write-ups on them available. Latika Sen, Ganguly, Amiya Dutt, Gita Sarkar, there are four of them. Similarly, in Tamil Nadu, the Tanjur work, uh, agricultural worker struggles ca are carried on. So, uh, and of course, cutting across a whole section of left and the Congress women, et cetera, the huge struggle against the Hindu code bill because there were very powerful voices, including in the Constituent Assembly, including in Parliament, who were all opposed to the reforms which are represented by the Hindu code bill. And there is enough available uh, material on how the Hindu code bill was finally passed. So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, we further, if we look at it organizationally, uh, then of course, internationally, there are women's discussions in terms of the NAM, the non-aligned movement in the UN conferences on issues of peace um, and organizationally new uh, platforms are set up, SEVA comes in. Uh, the Democratic Women's Federation, which is the AIDWAS unit in Tamil Nadu, comes up in 73. The Progressive Organization of Women in Hyderabad comes up in uh, 1974. Apart from some state level organizations, which are now all part of either NFIW or AIDWA in uh, some of the other states. Uh, and other organizations, which I had, some of whom I had mentioned earlier, which continue to exist. So I'll just take half a second. And we now come to the CSWI because there's hardly any time. So Sundarish, you can go to CSWI. Now CSWI is a committee which uh, is set up under the prime ministership of Indira Gandhi when um, there's uh, first information received that there will be an international conference on women held by the UN, which is the Mexico conference and uh, a sort of casual letter which is passed on to a minister in Indira Gandhi's cabinet and said that, look, see what you can do for this conference. And the um, person who plays a role in this is Pulreno Guha, who's also the chair of the uh, const, uh, CSWI, the Co Committee on Status of Women in India, who pursues it with Indira Gandhi and says, now let's use this as an occasion to sort of review the status of women, to, which is like saying, let's see what independence India has done. Now, uh, the report is very well known. It's available um, uh, uh, called Towards Equality. It had members such as, of course, Pulrenu Di, who was the chair, Leela Dubey, Lotika Sarkar, Veena Mazumdar, Urmila Haksar, Sakina Hassan, Mani Ben Kara, who was a trade unionist, uh, Savitri Shyam, Vikram Mahajan, and Neera Dobra, who was from the Northeast. Now, what I'm trying to say is there's no way I can discuss. Uh, I've asked Sundaresh to put these contents just to tell you how de what kind of detail they went in. But I'll just highlight some points because of the time limitation. So one is the scope and understand uh, scope of the study, the understanding, the findings, the follow up, the recommendations, ensuring there's a parliamentary debate. You have to remember this was just preceding the emergency. And the only way these women are so smart, they get a resolution 
passed saying that the findings of this committee will be placed in parliament what does it mean why did they do that and nurul hasan who's the minister concerned he places that in as a resolution in the lok sabha which ensures that a report which may be particularly critical of the government of india not of uh, any individual but the progress that has been made or not been made in the first 25 years that it will be placed in parliament means it will become a public document otherwise you know that government reports can be just put under the table but they ensure by putting a resolution in parliament saying that it will be tabled in parliament and hence ensuring that it will be a public document the rigor of inquiry the manner in which they went about in a sense they continued the tradition of the wrp sending questionnaires meeting with political leaders representatives of parties represent women representatives of trade unions etc um, and what is most interesting is that all of us who have ever been asked and i can tell you i have been myself asked to be on a government committee the pressure to say yes to everything that the government of india is saying whoever may be in power i'm not talking about any particular regime the pressure is that you keep sort of nodding your head and saying yes yes to everything that the government is claiming to do and having achieved and i think the fearlessness of this uh the this team that they were bold enough to say what was happening and what was not happening that comes out of a commitment that comes out of a commitment to democracy that comes out of a commitment to the task that has been assigned a commitment to see that change should happen that old prejudices and historical baggage should not be passed off as the uh, sort of excuse for not uh, sufficient change ha happening the rigor the social science uh, many of them like leela dubey was sociologist lotika dis law uh, meena was supposed to be there swami nathan but she resigned uh, uh, so some economic but you can see the number of tables they did i mean the rigorous social science analysis they undertook that this report still doesn't become out of date even now you will find just as the wrp they discussed the whole issue of crash of unpaid work um abortions the whole social sort of stigma and said that it is a woman's right to her body there's no uh, compromise on that even on the issue of consent they are very clear that woman it is the woman who has the right to give consent to sexual intercourse even within marriage and therefore there's no question of sort of any kind of uh, compromise on that the whole uh, issue of constitution um, you know, what's it called restitution of conjugal rights so there is a boldness and a fearlessness about the report there's also interesting continuities and discontinuities they are very clear that women are not a homogeneous category and it comes through their tables it comes through their discussions um uh, again we find uh, women's work uh, education law uh, health of course comes as part of government policies um these are some of the major chapters but the uh, i think chapter 2 yes the demographic perspective that is very interesting because you you know usually we think that oh it's only amartya sen who first talked about the missing women in the 90s but as you can see the demographers had already highlighted the demographic data but it was this committee which first talked of what we call the adverse child sex ratio in any significant manner and treated it as an indicator of women's status they had a whole table i've put that um, graphic uh, thing just to say that look i mean way back in 75 they discussed this at length and they discussed the whole issue of child marriage etc they, they were aware of regional differences um they were aware of um, uh, the more um, complicated issues with regard to migration migration for women's work being pushed under marriage uh, the socio cultural settings of women status and they discussed uh, you'll be surprised that apart from the whole role of religion which was also discussed by 
the women in the constituent assembly and here Hansa Mehta and all had intervened very categorically saying that in the name of practice and belief uh, anti-women practices should not be allowed to continue and here again in CSWI we have a discussion on religion women's sort of uh, uh, attachment to religion and yet the uh, ambiguities in terms of practices and belief they even discussed the restrictions related to menstrual cycle and how women are discriminated against how the whole ideological frame around womanhood motherhood etc marriage family polygamy bigamy guardianship how the women should be equally treated as guardians all that is discussed the uniform civil code is discussed as it was in the WRP. The question of criminal law and patriarchy in criminal law is very boldly discussed in the chapter on law particularly. And consent, adultery, for instance, is uh, discussed quite at length. Um, they're very clear that this notion to push women into only certain kinds of occupations or the lower levels of teaching or teaching as a feminized profession. They, uh, I mean, they're uh, dead against all kinds of stereotypes, etc. The chapter on economics and work um, uh, looks at unequal wages, discrimination, landlessness, bonded labor. Uh, it looks at Northeast very specifically in the whole North, women's role in the Northeast economy, in the market. Um, any kind of discrimination in the labor market is this. Uh, and the taboos, for instance, the stigmas attached to certain kinds of occupational um, uh, choices women make, as well as the fact that there are no choices or that educated women have very few options to look for work because of the nature. Uh, of um, And they're very clear that any kind of educational segregation in terms of um, only uh, uh, women getting only a specific kind of education is not to be accepted, no special curricula, uh, etc. Um, uh, this is, these are all very interesting because you see, this is from where you get your 1986-87 uh, education policy, which is called e education for equality. And despite that, in 2000, Manjit will remember, she would have got that circular also that women studies centers were told that you will henceforth be women and family studies, you know, so this attempt to keep slotting women into a particular box and saying, oh, this is your role, you are only mothers, you're only going to be dutiful daughters and uh, dutiful wives, etc. That struggle continues. Of course, the political struggle, uh, political rights and status issue is one of the critical issues in this report. It's an issue on which there is difference of opinion, because this is where the question of reservations for women in the political field is again discussed, and there is a difference of opinion. Veena Mazumdar, Lotika Sarkar, and Neera Dogra gave a dissent note, which is there in the report, if you read it. Um, uh, and Pulrenudi and Mani Benkara gave one on reservations at the panchayat level. Uh, so there were two notes of dissent, but the committee took note of the fact that despite so many years of independence, women's participation in political bodies was poor. That is why the issue of reservation came up despite the fact that in the Constituent Assembly, the women had unanimously taken a position against reservation. But what is also interesting is that all of them believed in the Constitution, they believed in the political system. So, you know, unlike today where we see a kind of cynicism about the political system, well, all politics is bad, it's all one kichad, hey, isme kaha gusoge, they, were, they had hopes. They had hopes, but they also had a more complex understanding of women's political rights and political participation. In fact, I was witness to Vinadi, for instance, writing to Mehbubul Haq when the South Asia Human Development Reports came out saying that uh, UN and your notion of gender empowerment measure, GEM, etc., there's issues with these indicators. 
um, because different societies have different traditions and you have to be more sensitive to levels of political participation and political rights. Um, uh, there's, uh, 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 so they were not part of that cynicism, uh, as I said. The recommendations are very, very clear. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, on the constitutional rights, on nationality, uh, on concept of matrimonial property, on the issue of co-passionary, which the Hindu Succession Act Amendment of 2005 finally addressed. Also, you should remember on polygamy and bigamy, the whole issue of cruelty against women within the domain of criminal law. This report talked about it very, very specifically. Uh, uh, as I said, the concept of matrimonial property, when divorce happens, women are thrown out with no resources because they haven't supposedly worked and because they supposedly haven't worked, so they haven't contributed to the resource building. So the what we call today the concept of joint matrimonial property. They also looked at what could be the mechanisms, and you may not know, but uh, CSWI is one of the reports which first talked of the need for a national commission for women. So these are the broad things. What I would like to say is two, three points which emerge from the CSWI, which are common. One is the whole notion of dissent within the committees on the uh, civil code, etc., on political rights, etc. But interestingly, I think one of the most interesting uh, two points which I would like to uh, emphasize before we uh, go in for discussion. One, the procedure and the process of getting wider uh, consultation. The WRP had gone for questionnaires, which had been then sort of multiplied and taken to students, meetings were held at that time, you can imagine, before independence in colleges like Indra Prastha College, which existed prior to 47 even, and all over. And they had uh, consulted women from workers, peasants, organizations, etc. cetera. Uh, and the whole question of unpaid work, crashes, etc. Similarly, CSWI goes in for a whole set of, I mean, the process is, uh, they undertake trips, they visit different places, they interact with women anywhere. I mean, you know, all kinds of platform, women uh, representatives from trade unions, political parties, they uh, enlist support from a whole community of academics. So Neera Desai, who was not on the committee, but uh, Ashok Mitra, of course, was sort of uh, the, uh, he was all, uh, the Registrar General of Census and the whole demographic thing from Ashish Bose and uh, the support they got. But also they um, drew up a methodology the second thing that I want to say is the continuity and the discontinuity that we see from previous com uh, documents and now that uh, there is a uh, there is cherishing of the tradition of debate to strengthen tools and to strengthen the interventions to sharpen the findings and the conclusions. So, the, so the idea is that it's not going to be just you know yes people around, but that you there will be a critical review. The third thing is, and I've written about this some years ago in a, a publication with the, which in fact, there's somebody here from JMC, uh, this is in Merrick College, and they bring out, I think, called something called the JMC Review, and I had contributed a piece for their bulletin two years ago. It might be on the net somewhere. Uh, how there is a continuity we see. And that is what I would like to highlight at this point. So uh, they, uh, they do, both these committees highlight the connections between women's status and the socioeconomic status of society, the socioeconomic path of development. It is very clearly stated 
in the CSWI, that women's status and poor status is not a question or a result of some kind of only cultural historical baggage. Why am I raising that? I'm raising this because, you know, generally there is a lot of discussion in the media amongst us about misogyny, mindsets, patriarchy. Uh, you know, we think it's of these men, their attitudes, but both WRP and CSWI very categorically make the statement and that underlies their understanding in a sense that women's status is actually directly linked to the path of social and the policies of social economic development which any which are followed at any time by the given country. And if today women's status is low in India, then it is also directly linked to the policies that are being pursued. And the two um, sort of indicators they saw, apart from the whole domain of law, education, health, uh, and on health, they were very critical, CSWI, they were very clear that this whole notion that women's health is all, all only about family planning is all wrong. They totally disagreed. And you can imagine because emergency was the period when forced sterilization and compulsory sort of family planning was at its peak in India. And prior, just pre-emergency, they make a very clear statement that this notion of giving incentives and compulsory or forced sterilization and population control, we totally disagree because it is the woman's choice. It is not even the family, but it is also the woman's choice to have a baby or not to have one. And they disagree. They also say that even the right to abortion, it is the woman's choice, whether she chooses to go ahead with this baby or not in terms of the MTP Act. They have a very clear statement on it. But more than that, the wider point that I was making, that they see the inequalities that women are subjected to, that these are grounded in the wider structures. And that is why, to, till the end, people like Professor Veena Mazumdar, one, uh, one or two indicators which they continue to highlight in every discussion, and she always, you know, since I had lots of discussions, one point she would always say, look, in 1921, you see the adverse child sex ratio. So the declining sex ratio comes up um, in 1921. And the decline in work participation also comes up from 1921. So this integral link between women's status as seen as and as indicated by the sex ratios and women's status in terms of the economy, their participation in the uh, uh, economy and work and the level of work, work opportunities, their contribution or the closures because of certain kind of policies that economies may uh, opt for or the trends that are visible. So what I'm saying is, this continuous attempt to A, look at the ground reality, to look at data, to see what are the trends emerging. And along with the trends emerging, then to analyze the linkages between these trends and the uh, visible sort of graphics, as well as the link with wider structures and how policies may bolster those very contradictory trends. This uh, sort of training which was which they drew upon from their social science training you can say from their academic intellectual training and I think both with WRP the Com constituent assembly debates and with CSWI what we find is that it's a small section of women who had these opportunities but they are using the and drawing upon the best of their academic training to look critically at the trends that are emerging and to use those to intervene in whatever debates that are going on in a constructive manner. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because all of you who may be listening to this, many of you may be students, some may be teachers, but who would still be very young. What I'm saying is that rather than be carried away by many of these debates which go on in the media, in, you know, endlessly. I think the lesson that we learn from these documents is that you have to 
polish your own tools to bring rigor to your own academic exercise and you have to use your academic tools to then turn the lens on to the wider framework of society in a more critical manner and to you you have to use and develop those critical tools and perspective to push for change which is your right which is your due in terms of what independent india promises and secondly also that never hesitate to disagree these people disagreed and they remained friends they became friends they remained friends till the end of their lives and they could disagree vehemently on any of these because it is in the process of disagreement in the process of debate that you sharpen the tools and i as i said that if at the time of independence at the time of partition at the time of still struggling for freedom if our constitution makers could have the confidence to disagree to debate to dissent and know that they will come to a consensus and bring up a constructive document which will lay out the future for india i think we there is a lot to learn from those histories from those earlier debates and from the achievements and the spirit that these people brought out i would end by saying that again go back to ambedkar apart from his more specific uh, inputs on the whole question of untouchability dalits etc but i think even in terms of the spirit of the constitution the question of constitutional morality which he emphasizes i think these are all issues which are important for us today also and i would stop with that we can have a debate thank yeah. you Uh, well, I'll request the participants if they have questions, please write in the chat box so that we can pick it up. Yeah. Okay. So if you have questions please write There's a huge in fact panorama of thoughts and panorama of resources and the events which Indu has covered and I'm very sure she has maybe more than this what she has already said and uh, the uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, putting just opposing the things that as vinay majumdar had put it saying that declining of sex ratio and declining of work participation had come up in 1921 is really an insight which of course even i must have also missed if these are the things which i think uh, the new scholar the people who are as she rightly uh, address the younger scholars that once you start looking at these issues one also has to see as to what are the connecting factors uh, even declining sex ratio is today today the case even after globalization so what how do we connect the uh, declining sex ratio 921 and declining sex ratio today so let's begin with that till people start writing questions <laughs> okay uh, there's something about muslim women yeah now people have started writing well it's a long question if yes. i can uh... is it a long question Mala Siddiqui has written, "Women who represent half of the population of the country, for five, only five percent, are the Muslim women. Despite the rights of secularism equally in civic sense, are liberty conferred by the Indian Constitution, the Constitution of Muslim Women in India, the condition of Muslim women in India." Uh, well i think some of it is getting repetitive uh, yeah. i'll address this if uh, that is the main question that has come i think um, the situation and the condition with regard to the muslim minorities but other minorities also remains a concern but muslims specifically it in fact belies the hopes that are uh, the represented and very visible and the concerns that come across in the constituent assembly debates and the hopes of our constitution makers uh, it is both i think it uh, that question today needs to be addressed both in terms of the administrative aspect of the executive 
for instance i mean if uh, uh, muslim uh, women or muslim children let us say are uh, deprived of education just as others are also i think it is a singular failure of the uh, successive governments because uh, i mean the as i said even during the wrpe the clear mandate that was expressed was univ compulsory universal education for all and if the state and the governments cannot reach education to every citizen of india i think it is a failure it is also linked to certain uh, let us say maybe uh, not only gaps in implementation but also uh, a callousness towards specific minorities as well as also specific socio economically marginalized groups so you will find for instance that uh, where where the school is located so the bastis would be far off from where the schools are located or the resources that are put into schools uh, i think um, uh, there is no Uh, there is no excuse for failure on the count of education vis-a-vis -vis any government in india any government be it state and education is also a state subject but i think there is um, no excuse uh, there's no excuse for uh, apart from saying that yes there are prejudices there are prejudices there are biases even in the minds of minorities about sending girls to school uh we know there are certain perceptions but i think if the state were to do its job better uh we could address those issues as far as uh the other rights are concerned i think uh more recent uh times give us other reasons for concern uh and i think it is the government's job uh whenever a new law is brought in i think it is the government's job be it the farmers that we are seeing today or minorities to convince the people of its uh, the uh, of its uh, purpose and uh, as we used to call it i mean you know if you are familiar at all with the legislative process when a new bill is brought in from the british times i've seen it in the archives you can go and look at the files related to any law any law uh, it's there's a statement of objects given uh, as a preamble to the law saying this is the purpose of this law that is being brought to the legislative assembly uh, i'm talking about early 20th century and even at that time for instance we all know that the child marriage bill was sent to two select committees not one but two uh and a very widespread um, um procedure of uh, getting feedback and opinion uh from both administrative aspects so if you look at the files on child marriage there are telegrams from i mean i can't even tell you akola ichankaranji tirunelveli talaseri all kinds of places thousands and thousands of memorandum apart from governors offices bar associations uh, administrative officials etc so doctors i mean so there is a procedure in terms of getting opinions of what we call in current parlance we call it stakeholders but i think even the colonial government followed that procedure and i think those options exist in order to allay the fears that pop people may have the allay the fears and apprehensions and i think part of governance is really about addressing those fears those apprehensions they may be misapprehensions also but those should be addressed and i think um, in our hurry sometimes to do what we think may be a good idea i think this hurried uh, uh, this haste which is shown in legislation sometimes uh, uh, it uh, generates fear and apprehension in the people uh, i don't think our political domain is richer for that so i think minorities are uh, victims of some of that kind of uh, misapprehension you can say or genuine apprehensions 
as also all marginalized communities i mean women have forever been in that situation you can uh, have a bill on sati i mean in 1987 a bill was brought by the um, it's 87 or 88 rajiv gandhi government they brought a bill on sati where they were not willing to discuss and what was it saying it, it had a concept of voluntary sati and we were saying what is this notion of voluntary sati so what I'm saying is one is in terms of governance, governance procedures, administrative policy, and those gaps must be addressed. The other is political fear or apprehension. And I think that has to be dealt with politically. That is not something that we can theoretically discuss here because politics has its own dynamics and governments in power always have their own um, dynamics and their own priorities that's a different matter but in terms of procedures this is always the best procedure and there is a long history of over a hundred years in india of this kind of procedure of sending bills to committees to select committees even dowry for instance the dowry law which we saw amended in 1983 84 uh, went through a joint select committee of parliament. There was a report which, and when we were in the anti-dowry movement, our, one of our first demands was implement the unanimous recommendations of the joint select committee of parliament. So those procedures are helpful because they uh, bring a lot more experience on the table and both doubts as well as criticisms. And I think that helps before legislating. Well, there is a question saying that what is the India status on marital rape? Oh. India's position, uh, uh, marital rape. Look, uh, it's, um, I think it's mixed still. Um, by and large, today the movement is very clear, although some organizations were not willing to uh, take up the issue of marital rape. Um, the issue of marital rape has been there from my early years of activism, I can tell you. Um, but, you know, uh, the experience of the movement is that you function at different levels. So you push something in the law, but you also have to build opinion around that law. You have to build a sentiment in favor of the changes that you want. Uh, which includes in the judiciary. I think in the judiciary, we have mixed responses. There are some who will uh, go along with the concept of marital rape. There will be some who will totally deny because they think this is part of marriage. I mean, the, if the contract of marriage means that you have consented to uh, sexual rights and intercourse, et cetera. But I think um, uh, over the last few years, we are seeing a more healthy discussion around the issue of consent and what a woman's consent means. But as I said, these are not issues you can just thrust down. You know, it's complex. So a, a judgment may take it to the next level and yet a second judgment may take it backwards. We've seen it on articles uh, on section 377. So uh, because unless something is specifically laid down in the law, otherwise with judgments and case histories, you go back and forth sometimes. Hopefully that will not happen. Uh, Justice Verma committee also discussed the issue of marital rape. As I said, in the movement, there is today a much wider consensus around the issue of marital rape, say, as compared to 1980s. But ground reality is something different because does a woman have, can she assert the right to say no? It's, uh, you know, you have to empower the woman in so many different ways before she can take a position in her own life and in her marriage. And those support systems have to be. There's another longish question on women, the Muslim women status. And I would read the last part of the she, Muslim women are deprived. This is what she, earlier also been said. The fundamental rights like Farda, custom, illiteracy, social separation, stipend, social separation, Religious uh, ties, conservative environment, and weak economic conditions are still pressing issues. How these problems can be redeemed? Sorry, I'm basically these are the yeah. issues which are concerning Muslims. How do we address these? 
Well, my response would be to say, you tell me, is parda illiteracy, sep social separation, lack of economic uh, support, religious uh, taboos, uh, conservatism, weak economic condition, are these not common to all women? You tell me that. They are common, they are common issues for all women in India. The degrees may vary, but the degrees will vary not necessarily on grounds of religion. The degrees will vary in terms of that woman's socioeconomic location, her family's location, her ability to garner literacy and resources, etc. But these are common issues. They are not religion specific. In pockets, they may multiply in greater extent amongst Muslims, they would, for instance, they would be common to Dalits who have been deprived of all opportunities for equality except through reservation. And it is reservation that has worked to allow for a section of Dalits to reach a level of equality in terms of opportunity, even to try for those opportunities. So these are common. Yes, what you're, if you're pointing to the prejudices which exist in within those are also common they're also common i mean i uh, i can tell you if you go to rural india or leave alone well there's a lot of news please remain on mute she would answer in case you require you can write again what I'm saying, can you please remain on mute? What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is denial, denial of equal rights, equal opportunities, the existence of social prejudices and biases, male prejudices, these are all common, common across uh, communities. The degree may vary. I have had students, I mean, somebody here wrote that she did her graduation from Vivekanand College. I taught in Vivekanand College for 24 years. I can tell you across communities, there was resistance to say a uh, choice uh, of autonomy and freedom in terms of choice of marriage or in terms of um, uh, discrimination within the homes between boys and girls or restrictions on women mobility. I had students, for instance, who had studied and lived all their lives in Delhi. And once my student came up to me because I was taking her to the National Museum, she said, ma'am, is that anywhere near India Gate? I've lived in Delhi all my life. I've never seen India Gate. No, I mean, even I as a teacher could not have imagined there would be teachers, students who would come and say, no, we are not allowed to go even to the National Museum with our teacher, our families object. What I'm saying is, that as a teacher also, and as an activist, and as a social scientist, you see there are certain common privileges which come with socioeconomic uh, indicators and wealth and affluence. And there are certain common indicators of deprivation and social prejudice. And social prejudices, mindsets, assertion of patriarchal mindsets cuts across communities. It's your ability to garner levels of opportunity in your life, which your family and social location determine for you, they predetermine. But once you have that ability, I think it is how you negotiate. There's a continuous process of negotiation, continuous. It, it is never ending in the lives of women at all stages of their life and for all women in India, by and large. I mean, there are a privileged few who may not face any discrimination. There may be a few who may not have faced discrimination, but will face prejudice. There are a few who will not face discrimination nor prejudice, but will face hostility in certain stages of their life. What we are talking about is systemic discrimination. So the, as far as governments go, Governments and the state are not allowed to and should not be allowed to practice policies which discriminate between sections of the people and populations. I think that we should agree to. The other part is a part of negotiation. I'll say something. 
you see there are there is conservatism and there is a level of fundamentalism you know it's saying nahi ye hamara mazhab nahi kehta it is that is common to hindus and muslims also let me tell you all of us have grown up with those countering those or confronting those uh, attitudes but uh, there was a friend of ours she was a very well known colleague uh, she, i think still there in bombay razia razia Pat patel i think and she had studied this very categorically and she came up with a formulation which i broadly agreed with that if there is conservatism and prejudice and fundamentalism in the majority community then that is reflected and multiplied in the minority community so if you want to fight fundamentalism you have to fight amongst all it's not as if you can identify one community and say ye pichri soch ke hai ye backward hai it doesn't work like that um you will find for instance if there's poverty then poverty social deprivation and prejudice go together because if there are less resources then a family has to choose between sending two children or one child to school and keeping the other one at home we know that prejudice will work and it will go in favor of boys usually so those are the ways you know we should also look at it more critically more rigorously sometimes we also assume that this is the reason that may not be the actual reason so we need to be more open to what we call rigorous analysis and we need to be committed to that yeah another one uh, saying that uh, what is the impact of ucc on muslim women well there is no ucc as of now and on the ucc in fact i will be discussing that in my next lecture or or the next one so i don't want to spend too much time on it today because uh, we we will be discussing it um the uniform civil code was a demand of the women's movement right from the beginning okay and it is there in the wrpe it is there in towards equality in wrpe there is also a note of dissent by kapila khandwala which i had mentioned in my last lecture however over the last um, say since 1985 86 uh, in the contemporary women's movement there has been a lot of discussion and debate around this because there is a lot of experience of the movement of working amongst women hindus muslims christians everyone the movement has a huge amount of experience gathered over decades let us face it the prejudicial interpretation that is given and there are books on it i can name some of them there are books and papers and a political understanding which is propagated that hindu law has been reformed it is the muslims who are prejudiced and who are not allowing social reform that is that is a not the case there has been some amount of reform and there has been a lot of resistance when the hindu court bill was passed in fact that was what i wanted to discuss <coughs> at a bit of greater length in the 1950s that was the big debate and women who were hindu women who were supporting the hindu court bill provisions were attacked physically physically i mean all the women i have interacted with of that generation have given me details of how in colleges meetings were held for instance uh, in ashutosh college in calcutta in bhu uh, in one meeting um, professor radha krishnan was invited so that that some amount of this opposition would be silenced because he could also quote from the shastras etc i mean this was been amazumdar herself telling me all this but what i'm saying is there was tremendous opposition and the kind of writing the kind of vilification or oh, what divorce will lead and who are divorced women and what adoption and what giving property rights even in 1937 when the hindu women's right to property act was brought in you should see all the journals in hindi for instance also apart from others 
they brought out entire issues on how widows are so you know immoral in character or now you will give them property means you're only breeding and encouraging immoral i mean you know there are direct reflections of some of these so you see this draft bill comes into the legislative assembly and here is the unleashing of this kind of thing you will find that kind of prejudice all across and all over the additional additional issue which we see on the whole issue of uniform civil code i mean you tell me there was one statement made in parliament and it's part of history so there's no no not taking names um our former home minister lal krishnan advani for instance was known to have said we believe in the uniform civil code as in goa now what is specific to goa i asked i did not know when i heard this statement frankly i, I went and then studied the goa act and i what did i find goa act says that if a woman fails to produce an heir and that to a male heir then the man can go for a second marriage now wh what is specific and why should we go for a uniform civil code should the uniform civil code be a replica of the hindu code bill i mean there are thousand and one issues and when you have stoked fears and apprehensions amongst minority communities then the you know this waving of the U ucc as we call it becomes an additional threat to people that our customs our identities our uh, you know uh, beliefs and practices are under threat on the other hand you have this great body called the all india muslim personal law board we've all interacted with people or heard them and the women muslim women have gone i mean i have known of occasions if i look for my references i can give you dates when meetings of the muslim personal law board have been held and these women have been saying be please discuss these issues they refused they refused and there was huge sort of um, uh, thing happening out saying saying why are you not discussing these issues so there is resistance within communities what is the position of the women i would like to discuss that in the next lecture but broadly our point and i think the movement's position is reform of personal laws is required but reform of personal laws should be proceeded along with discussions to assure the communities that this is not against diversity and diverse community identity but as we said that women must get equal rights and women must get equal rights both in personal laws and in the secular laws and those options should remain they should remain so but we need a mature debate which is not charged with a kind of atmosphere where minorities or any particular community feels that they are the besieged and they are under attack and their practices are under attack but communities must confront the inequalities that they perpetuate be it in the name of religion or in terms of custom or social practice i think that uh, the uh, i've written about this long ago uh, um in a uh, in an article in the wire i think in 2016 i wrote something where i had argued and i'd given the references how um, hindu laws were opposed i mean after all we've got memoranda they're sitting in the tin murti library by the hindu masaba women saying why the hindu code bill should not be implemented uh, legislated upon uh, what was her name i think lakshmi bai kelkar i'm forgetting the name Uh, but um, there's memoranda from the hindu masaba and the hindu masaba activists were leading the battle against all those women who were uh, in favor of the hindu code it was a big battle for many many years okay so all communities resist change in all communities there are leaders who behave as if they are the ones who are the uh, arbiters of this social change i don't think women accept that and women should not accept and history doesn't accept it i mean nobody is a takedar of any community let's face it wo jagirdari chali gayi feudalism khatam ho gaya aur nahi hua to usko khatam kar dena chahiye so no religion is the jagir of it but there should be space for discussion 
and with sensitivity, particularly in times when there is insensitivity or a sense of being besieged, I think all fears should be put at rest. No community, no individual should feel that they are besieged in democratic India, I think. And, but the process of change must be pushed and all women should get equal rights as per our constitution. Our framework is the constitution. Your religious faith and belief and practices are equally your right as per the constitution of India, but no woman should be denied equality as per our constitution on the basis of any other identity. That is the position, and that is the position that the women's movement accepts. I think there are a few participants asking for reading material, if you could send it across, or maybe you can get connected with you on the mail. So, but as far as these documents are concerned, that is why I spoke of documents. They are mostly available on the net. The Constituent Assembly debates are published in print. They are also available on the net. Um, the Towards Equality is also available on the net. As far as readings around this, I mean, I'm sure the political science departments must be full of readings on the Indian Constitution and on legislative assembly debates. And uh, where, uh, then uh, as far as the women are concerned, there are both biographies of many of the women and autobiographies. For instance, Ejaz Rasul has an autobiography, um, how many? The Chinese Velayud and some parts are there. Mira has also written some. But there are books on many of them. Saroni and I do, of course, we all know. And some methods. So Durga Bai Deshmukh, there is a lot available on all these women. As far as um, the larger uh, issues go, on every aspect. I mean, be it on fundamental rights or being on the whole issue of uh, minorities, on um, tribes uh, and uh, scheduled tribes, as we now call them, uh, on the Northeast, uh, because these uh, uh, debates are continuous and they have continued in Indian politics ever since, with every amendment also, these debates. But I think um, the richness of the CAD itself is something which our students should look at because it also reaffirms a faith in the process and in the commitment that our leaders made to the Indian people. And I think it's always good to read that. Uh, towards equality, of course, has been written about at length. Bina Mazumdar's writings are there. Lotika Sarkar's writings are there. There's Neera Desai. Um, uh, many of the others um, also wrote their autobi. I think Urmila Hatsar has uh, something written. Um, Mani Ben Kara, there is an, I think there's a biography her, of her because she was a well-known tra uh, trade unionist from Gujarat. Um, Lida Dubey, of course, was a well-known scholar who, uh, in fact, the whole discussion on family in this and Lida Dubey's writings on the family are very well-known. So um, that's there. Uh, I think the CWDS website will give a lot. The CWDS library, if you're in Delhi, is a very good source for anything and everything related to these issues. And uh, your own library in Delhi University, Manjit, will have a hell of a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we also will have a lot of material, yeah. 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 Well, I think we will end today. And these questions, I'm, I'm sure they'll also come up in the next lecture. And uh, do, I mean, why, in the, where is your window? I know I'm not able to get you on the window. Why, I can see myself. I can see myself. Yeah. Oh, maybe last time also it got clicked. Maybe you could see just oh. yourself. Oh, and it, no, I haven't done anything. I know I'm, I'm the only one on the screen. I don't oh. see you. No, I can see you and I can see myself. Also. Anyway, when you, we are going to end today. And thank you so much for your questions. And thank you so much for the discussion. And uh, I, I would say that definitely the kind of lecture, which I know how Hindu speaks and how Hindu has so much of material. 
and uh, the area which she has covered she has plenty more to cover i'm very very sure and she in fact started with the fact that she's only covering the tip of the iceberg there's so much of material which in case any scholar who really wants to study uh, even post independence the women's movement and how the issues came up and what are the juxtaposing uh, issues around one issue and i think she has already indicated the kind of methodology you should be using and uh, and these questions if they come up for the next lecture maybe more clarity would also emerge and uh, in case you want to get in touch with uh, uh, indu the if you if you can note down uh, the the email it is i agnihotri 53 at gmail.com so and uh, and this uh, if you if you can note it down is fine otherwise you can get in touch with women studies will or with the cwds you will get the uh, get her email id so thank you so much indu it was a real pleasure listening to you and uh, i had not heard you on the uh, assembly debates it was really interesting to listen to you thank you so much we will thank meet thank you manjit and thank you sundaresh <laughs> yeah. for the support <laughs> yeah i really need it and uh, the on 2nd october we are again going to meet even if it is a holiday our, our lecture series would go on thank you so much for your participation thank you indu and sundresh